Hi, I'm Bill Patton with the Infinite Vision Coach and the book uh, Visual Training for Tennis. And today I have with me Ryan Hanrahan from Make Tennis Great Again. And Ryan does a lot of amazing marketing stuff for tennis. And he's a coach, entrepreneur. Lately, he and I have been doing a lot of work together. So I'm really excited about this newfound friendship and partnership that we are putting together. How are you doing today, Ryan? Uh, good, thanks, Bill. I'm happy to be on the show once again. Forward to answering all the questions you have there. Okay, good. Now, here's fun. This is the comedy part. These are the comments to the video that I have on YouTube. <laughs> and as you can see, one week ago, Dame Rabada Rabada says, I'm single, right? And then that person whose name can't really be pronounced says, Love you, and then puts kissy emojis on there. And these are spam accounts, but I just thought that people should know what YouTube is really all about. Yeah. All right. In this video, Visual Training for Tennis, I will read it to you. You can read along, and then we'll get your answer. Now, so here we go. Which body part is the most essential to play tennis? A, legs. B, eyes. C, arm. D, hand. B eyes. Okay, so you are correct, <laughs> Ryan, because if you're in the visual training for tennis quiz and you don't guess eyes, you don't deserve to get a single answer right. Question number two, true or false, there is a universal visual tennis instruction that applies to all players. False. That's good. And see, what should tip you off there is the use of the word all. Universal and all, because, you know, there's so few absolutes in life. Question number three. What is the most common major error players make in vision? A, watching the ball. B, keeping their eye on the ball. C, failing to focus. <clears throat> D, not seeing the ball out of the opponent's frame. Mm, um, Most common major error. D. And you are correct. When you use the phrase, watch the ball, it means A, almost nothing. B, figure it out on your own. C, scanning. D, focusing. E, a and B, F, C and D. Mm. A bit more in detail question. Uh, a. Oh, that is excellent. Yes, absolutely. That is that is the correct answer. Four out of four. Can he keep it up? No, I haven't seen you, this quiz before either. You, so. you no. This is a. It's a very important disclaimer to make. Ryan has not been subjected to the quiz. We did not feed him any any of the debate answers ahead of the presidential debate. He did not, he does not have a listening, oh wait, he does have a listening device in his ear. Number five, there are two different ways to see the ball that affect players dramatically in their ability to see the ball best. A, pure and cross-dextral. B, far and nearsighted. C, focus and pinpoint vision. D, Blurred and focused vision. A. Yeah. And cross-textual. Yep. Yep. So this is something you <laughs> didn't know about a couple of weeks ago, but now you do. All that right. one I might not have got right. Yes. Pure and cross-dextral is the other one. And I'm happy with my questioner because anyone with a conventional wisdom of vision would probably have a hard time picking an answer. Six. When is the best time? To focus on the ball, A, when the opponent hits, B, once the ball crosses the net, C, from the bounce into your frame, D, at all times during the point. A. Ah, uh, he got one wrong. I, B. I mean, I, no, it's also not B. Try one more. C. It is C. All right. Yeah, I was double guessing that one. Yeah. So let's circle back and talk about 
each one, each question, and yep. and the importance. Why is it true? All right, which body part is the most essential to play tennis? Um, you know, and it's the eyes because there are no blind tennis players that play anything that resembles the real sport of tennis. Although I, I've seen a picture of a young man who doesn't have legs and he hops along on a tennis court and, and is able to rally balls back and forth. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen, I, you know, I know that I, there's a guy, um, Hunt is his last name. I forget his first name right now, but he doesn't have a hand. He just has a kind of a stub. He has his forearm kind of comes to an abrupt end and he plays tennis and he's quite an accomplished player. Um, I do for, I, I'm forgetting his first name. I think it's Alex Hunt. I think he's an Aussie. I've heard of him, but I can't remember his name either. So Yeah, yeah. So anyway, and there are people who are missing an arm and they still play tennis. So, you know, but without your eyes, you just can't, you can't see the ball. You can't react to it. Um, it's, it's fundamental. Uh, anyway, That's right. number two, to, why, <clears throat> You can probably explain this one. Why is it not true that there is a universal visual tennis instruction that applies to all players? Why? Um, well, people have different. Uh, oh, it goes down to question five. I guess it links up to that. Everyone has a different eye they focus on. They focus through in a different hand they play with. Yes. So. So yeah. I mean, and. You know, everyone's different. Everyone's as different as their fingerprint. Uh, but visual researchers say that vi visual experience is the way in which people differ the most. That e everyone has a unique way of seeing that is not common to someone else. Um, which doesn't mean there isn't overlap between different waves of seeing. So, for instance, um, uh, Cheryl Calder uh, has tested 100,000 athletes and found no two who have the same visual strength and weakness profiles. So, you know, that's pretty wow. amazing that out of, a, I mean, you would think that out of 100,000 that there would be some that would be so similar you could call them the same, but, but they're not. You could almost rephrase the question on a harder test. Is there any players that have the same visual instruction, tennis instruction? Yeah. And the answer still be um, true. There's not. So it'd be false, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, no, that's a good point. And so, so what it means to me, the, the practical application of that is that um, tennis coaches need to have a wider variety of visual tools in their toolbox to be able to work with people who have unique abilities. So like, for instance, um, I was coaching this young girl and she was very creative and, and we were talking about, you know, how to, you know, the kind of the, how a stroke and I was demonstrating. And then she said, Oh, it's like spreading frosting on cupcakes. <laughs> and and I stopped and I because no one had ever said that I'd never thought of anything like that of any way to describe you know the arcing of a stroke but then I thought about it and I was like okay well this is unique to how see, she sees right so I could yeah. say no that's stupid that's no it's not like <laughs> that or I can work with that I can say okay let's work with the unique way that someone sees and affirm them and, and try to understand what do they mean when they say that. So then I said, yes, very large cupcakes. So, I mean, it's not, yeah, a, per and it, very it's large, not yeah. a, it's not a perfect analogy. And, and so I did say yes, but I mean, because, because it's not all in two dimensions that we're working. So, you know, there are limitations to it, but, we if it helps it, go ahead if it helps you can use it um yeah i find that different analogies and 
yeah, you're right. It relates to what people see and probably see more than anything else and sometimes feel and things like that. But seeing is probably the major part of it. Yeah. You know, and sometimes on court, I might say, um, hey, here's a little thing that happened. Did you see it? And I'm amazed sometimes that people didn't see certain things. Yeah. Or that... <laughs> Or that their ability to recall something that just happened, to recall an image of something in their mind of what has just occurred, it's not there or it's not developed or maybe they don't even have that capacity. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it boggles the mind because see, it's it bumps into the, that we assume that what we see is what other people see yeah that's right it's different perspectives comes down i guess to what you're thinking in the in the moment as well like what you're going to focus on so that comes down to when to focus and what to focus on in, yes. re in real life but also in tennis is yes if you yeah. focus on the wrong thing then you're not going to be able to see the things you need to see well, yeah, and, and that's where we open up um, we open up the rabbit hole of of what's going on in people's heads that block them from seeing what they need to see. So, like just now, I just came back from being on the court with someone who constantly evaluates herself. Um, it ha is running a checklist in her mind of things that she needs to do to execute a shot and it is almost nonstop analyzing everything that's happening. So, so periodically I have to stop and say, okay, come out of your mind and drop all that stuff and come back to your senses. What do you see? Um, so, and, you know, and, and I think part of it is Western, Western world, Western society, uh, we're trained to always be busy, to always be thinking, to problem solve, um, and, and to subjectively judge things. I think other cultures yeah. don't have that same training. I mean, I think in more Eastern cultures, there's more value placed on observation. Soaking quiet, the knowledge in and then adapting. Yeah. Quietness, stillness, you know, paying close attention to what is actually happening. Sometimes yeah. people call me a Zen tennis coach and I don't, I, I used to like that, but I don't really, feel that way anymore i think i'm i'm trying to be more scientific i mean and that's what i tell them I'm, I'm i'm following the brain science i'm not i'm not a buddhist <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a good point yeah but yeah i mean i get that label every once in a while all right let's go on let's let's dig into the next one what is the most common major error players make in vision and the answer is not seeing the ball out of the opponent's frame. You want to take a stab at that, at why that's the most common major error? Why? I guess it comes down to they, they're not thinking that's important to focus on. They're probably more worried about something else in terms of their own technique or whatever to get out to the ball rather than actually focus on what's going to happen so they can do that i think it's just a lack of awareness to do that more than anything yeah on, on a stab on a stab yeah so um so what do you think is the negative impact of not seeing the ball coming out of the opponent's frame delayed reactions um not positioning yourself right not being able to watch the ball in the right moment. Um, lack of clarity where you're going to hit your shot. Um, so no tactical planning, just reactive kind of play rather than trying to beat the opponent. You're just trying to 
staying the point more than anything. Yeah, I think I think you made a lot of really good points there. And yes, the tactical awareness is built into the into that because if you're seeing the ball come out of their strings, then you're also your brain's also taking in the relative position of your opponent on the court at the same time. So you're much yeah. more likely to <clears throat> take note of exactly from where they struck the ball, how well they struck it. And then and then you may even actually, you know, have these contingencies of, okay, what am I going to do next? Right? Oh, if if, yeah. if he coughs up another short ball, then I'm going to hit a short angle to the other side or, you know, whatever. You could even maybe have some pre-planning going on. Uh, now, and you don't learn, I guess, the opponent's patterns. Right. And you alluded to that. Second guessing. Yeah. You alluded to this, but I just wanted to underline it that the that the most con- the most important part of it is that when you see the ball coming out of the opponent's strings, your brain very quickly and very passively um, gives you a lot of data. You, your brain yeah. gathers a lot of data. By the time the ball is out of the racket by two feet, your brain with 95% accuracy has determined where it's going. Yeah. So then that empowers you to actually move more quickly. And I find people automatically move better as soon as they put more attention onto their opponent's contact point. All right. Yeah, so, yeah. yep. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> So uh, we're halfway through, and I think once we um, – you want to stick around to the end because I know Ryan's got some uh, announcements that he wants to make. Or maybe we should – let's take a break, Ryan. you got a, some stuff to talk about about the Between the White Lines Summit. And by the way, yes, that's, where, that's where Ryan and I actually became familiar with each other on the initial Be- Between the White Lines Summit hosted by Mark Jeffrey which was an amazing event. So take it so away. So we're going to, we're having between the white lines. Oh, thanks, Tom, Bill. Sorry. We're ha- having between the white lines coming up sometime between March and April. And the objective for between the li- white lines is growing the private sector postcode by postcode and helping people grow their businesses, their clubs in their communities to get the game growing faster. Um, and using expert speakers who have the answers to similar problems everyone has around the world to help and share to grow the game together rather than trying to be in our own silos one by one. And we're about to launch the, um, I guess, the launching phase of the build-up to um, Between the White Lines in Australia coming up in April and uh, March or April. So check out our, um, we're going to have podcasts and trailer videos and different things coming up, but be sure to give us your feedback on what you're hoping that you can get out of the, the game and to really grow your business and club and what you think could help coaches and clubs around the world to get this sport basically great again, not in terms of the game's not great, but I think we could have more players in a simpler structure, really progressing the way they want and achieving results and engaging the community. Tennis is really a community sport where anyone can connect, whether they're another sport or they're an activity or school or TAFE. We can all connect uh, and tennis is very dynamic that it can do these kind of things. It's also known as the healthiest sport in the world. So thanks, Bill. I think that's probably a good briefing. Okay, excellent. Uh, I do have one follow-up question on that, though. So do you have... Do you have um, speakers lined up and or do you have any that you can share who they are? Um, yes, I know who they are. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share them yet. Okay, but so I you're not allowed to that. share them. So you, about how many Andrew, speakers? Andrew Hill, Andrew Hill and okay. myself yes, are working he, on this along with Mark Jeffrey, who's the founder of Between the White Lines. Um, and we have lined up 20 speakers or so. Um, most of them we have asked. Um, and we'll have also expert speakers outside of the tennis world to encourage people to look outside the outside of the tennis world and realize there's a lot of stuff they can do to help 
help save time or create more business so they can focus on coaching and grow their game and connect with other coaches. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I saw Andrew Hills and his was amazing. All right. So let's get back to the quiz now. Yeah. There's a little commercial break there. And uh, let's go back here to do, do, do share. All right. So we're back there. Yep. All right. Question four, I think. Question four. When you use the phrase, watch the ball, it means almost nothing and figure it out on your own. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, so, it's, go ahead. Yeah, so that basically means watch the ball, but that's where I go. So when, how, you know, kind of things is what the rest of the question is alluding to. So if you just tell people to watch the ball, do you mean before I hit the ball? while I go pick it up or you know what I mean? Like people don't know what you're talking about. So it's so general, you've got to zone in on that particular thing or the niche of the point, if you want to say. You know, that that's a really good point. And that's something that you said that before and it stuck with me and I'm now experimenting with some new stuff. And I think, I think one thing that this isn't a fully formed thought, but I just want to share where my next place is that I'm going is that the question where is maybe the most important question on in tennis um, yeah. when it comes to vision. So actually just in the last couple of days, I started doing this. I started asking my players to move to the place where they can catch the ball and put it where they want. Mm. And I think that it's the fascinating thing is that when you use the word where, the, the location of things, finding things goes through the faster pathway in your brain. Yeah. But the what, the what, the trying to analyze things or identify things um, and categorize them, that goes through the slower pathway. So when the question is, okay, where do you need to be in order to hit that ball well, right? Move to the yeah. place, move to the place where you can catch it right there. If you want to hit it up in the air, maybe you want to meet it here. So, so I've been doing a lot of here and where and there. And, and that's been very interesting to see the effect on my students. But I don't, I can't really uh, put it into words really well. But I have seen that players are, seem to be moving more smoothly to the place where they need to be. Yeah, uh, I also think uh, another good one that I do is, um, yeah, that I like to focus on is a better way to phrase it, is, and Dan and Sterling actually cover this in their course as well, is which part of the ball should you be focusing on? And for the base, basic beginner, I usually just say watch the back of the ball, but there is other parts of the ball you can watch as you get a bit better depending on what you're trying to do and where your opponent is. But if you watch the back of the ball as a beginner, then your head is tilted in the right spot for your balance because your eyes, as well as your head, control where your balance is going to be. That's interesting. And another interesting thing, and I just happen to have a little uh, promotional squishy tennis ball right here. Right. All right. But one thing, one thing that's interesting is you'll run into players who seem to be only able to hit topspin. They don't seem able to flatten out their shots very well. Yep. So with those players, I tell them to look at the top of the ball and to try to keep the top edge of their racket up with the ball so that they're yes, then no. able. Yeah, and it, it's it's really kind of amazing what that does. I mean, I, I had a player that I was working with that that was ready to quit tennis and was under a lot of pressure to get a Division One scholarship or or you know it was going to be a failure. But anyway, very quickly 
she made a big, big up uh, improvement in her game because she was able then to drive the ball instead of always hitting so much topspin and hitting a lot of miss hits because of it. And then also having a lot of softer shots that landed short in the court. I mean, that's disaster, right? So yeah. anyway, when she would learn to drive the ball, that was a lot better. The opposite works too. You end up with players who, for whatever reason, they can hit relatively flat, but they just can't seem to get any really major top spin on the ball because they mm. sort of take a scooping action. So I have yeah. those players look at the bottom of the ball because that's the perceptual issue. This is largely um, influenced by Mark Elliott, who had some really interesting um, visual teachings as well. So yep. then what I tell them to do is make sure that the top part of the racket is below the bottom of the ball, and then that helps them to get under it enough so that they can lift up and hit topspin. So that's an example of what you were saying about you know, where exactly to look, right? And then, you know, in a moment here, we're going to talk mm -hmm. the differences between the where, what, what kind of vision to use, when, and mm -hmm. where, you know? So, all right, let's move on to number five. And yeah, this there is a good one. You, you want to read the question and the correct answer? Yep, there are two different ways to see the ball that affect players dramatically in their ability to see the ball the best. And that is pure and cross dextral, <coughs> which is if you're right handed, then you're watching the ball with your right eye if you're pure, and your left oh. eye if you're crossed. Oh, okay. You said you said that a way that I wasn't ready for. So sorry. What? <laughs> No, so uh, maybe I can clear up the understanding of that a little bit. All right, so yeah. pure dextral people are right-handed and right-eye dominant. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, and left-handed people are, you know, left-handed people would also be left-eye dominant. So if your dominant eye is the same side as your hand, you're pure dextral. Yeah. And if they're crossed, then it's cross dextral. So that that goes without saying. So left eye dominant, which I am, and right handed is cross dextral. <clears throat> and you were going to go ahead. Emphasis on crossing the nose, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it is interesting. Well, whichever is your dominant eye, you know, the, your nose is in the way of it looking forward on one side or the other. But the, we digress. Let's not let's not get into that one just yet. But anyway, the, <laughs> the um, there are two different strategies that seem to work with these people. With pure pure dextral, this in my laboratory on the road working with strangers who then it it works. Um, this, with pure dextral, it seems to be the best strategy to look at a place focus on a place that's halfway between the bounce of the ball and your frame and then use your periphery your peripheral vision to allow the ball to cross you, you know your vision into the ball into the racket whereas cross dextral people are better advised to focus on the ball directly from the bounce right into the racket and that's where you get Federer you know looking straight into the ball you know the, the the ball straight into the racket and that's where you get Agassi who I believe is pure dextral looking slightly ahead of contact um and Serena Williams and and many others you know so and I became fascinated with this because because of what I saw in tennis magazines where there would be a picture of Federer, you know, and it was a green circle and it said, cause yes, cause he's an angel and he does everything perfectly, you know? And so they said, do that. And then the other picture, there's a red X, you know, and that's wrong, unacceptable, bad. But then there, it's a picture of a grand slam champion. I'm like, yeah. well, it can't, it can't be that maladaptive. I mean, even, Everybody would love to be a, a one, stamp, one slam wonder, you know? I mean, so 
it can't be that bad of a what so it made me wonder why why is it that we do that we we have these we create these interesting false standards that we put on other people yeah it can't be that bad but it they could have a point where it might not be that good either well in, in from Cause... what from my research it's actually great if you're pure dextral and you try to behave cross dextrally you're gonna have a problem mm -hmm. and vice versa so i yeah i don't we don't want to start arguing with that right now no, <laughs> <laughs> just breaking up questions but yeah <laughs> yeah no th this is something now i'm as you can tell i'm very keen on trying to be extremely clear that that i would be it would be hard to convince me otherwise i'm open to yeah. the discussion i really am but but i want people to know something that i really feel feel strongly about because there's so much proof social no, more proof. commenting yeah commenting more on the point that um just because they're a grand slam champion doesn't mean they do everything good that's all well that is a very good point yes and yeah. so there are a lot of strange idiosyncratic things that that grand slam champions have done that no one should ever copy <laughs> yeah i mean you know i mean i, I was never know the reason why Right. I mean, like, for instance, um, look at the behavioral ticks of Rafael Nadal. I would never tell my players that they have to do 19 different obsessive little things on the court to try to win a tennis match. <laughs> Putting the bottles just like this, you know, and stepping over the lines. And then, then the, <laughs> adju the adjustment of the underwear, which I'm only going to describe very nicely just like that. Right. I mean, so, but no, I mean, e even things in their game. I mean, I don't think I would ever teach anyone to serve like Andy Roddick. I mean, it's, a, it's such a, it's such a wildly different type of stroke that, um, it could be I don't know how, as long as you know why. Yeah. I mean, but you, you uh, yeah. I think it's just a very special stroke. And sometimes there are these things that are so idiosyncratic that, copying them is counterproductive yep. people should learn to play like themselves all right that's that was a nice nice I nice agree. uh we went off on a really good tangent there all right final question i'll let you read this one again when is the best time to focus on the ball and i went through all the other options except the right one and that's at the at all i'm oh, sorry it was I got to the third question of the third time, right? Sorry, from the bounce into it's, your frame. I'm sorry, I remember yes, the right answer then. Yes. Okay. And then do you know why? Um, no, like I, you probably okay. told me why, but I can't remember. Okay. It's all right. So, uh, so in order to really truly focus, your body needs to be relatively still. When your body's in motion, you're. It, especially the faster the motion your body's in your eyes cloud up and things become blurry and that's sort of a um that's a, a very instinctive um what's the word it's a it's a reaction to danger because it you know like let's here's the scenario if you're being chased by a tiger through the forest then you need to not be able to see many little branches because you're going to yep. get scratched up in, in evading that tiger, you know, but if you saw all of them, then you might not run like you should. Yeah. Yeah. I get your point. Yeah. You know, I mean, you'll still be able to see the branch that will knock you out, hopefully. <laughs> so, but now, but now, so, so the, the application is that, you know, by the time the ball has bounced, you if you've done all of your footwork, then you should be relatively still from the time of the bounce into the time of the ball going into your racket. And then not only that, but we can only really truly focus for very short periods of time. So trying to maintain focus for more than, you know, half a second is not really productive you can focus for longer but it's very tiring to your eyes 
So just saving the focus for the last segment of the ball bounced, and now I'm focusing on it into my racket, and then I will go into sc scanning as it goes, or I'll go into tracking as it goes away from me. I'll scan as the opponent hits, then I'll track again until it bounces, and now I'm focusing for a short period of time, and you're your eyes can phase in and out of these different skills. So on a regular ground stroke, what if you hit like um, a half volley or there's a smash or even a high bouncing forehand and you prepared, I guess you stopped earlier or later, I guess, would it still come from the bounce or do you have a different reference point there? Oh man, you, you got the good tough questions. So now, so <laughs> And I think what your what your question points to is is the endless variety of problems that need to be solved that there are yeah. so few finite answers to. So I would say take the particular player that is having a visual issue that you can't understand and dig into it and help them discover the skill that helps them play the shot. But yeah, I mean, yep. if, if you're taking a ball on a, on the hop and like, you know, you like you're standing one foot from the baseline and the ball is three inches from the baseline and you're just taking a very quick half volley, then you may have only tracked that ball. You may have not focused on it for a moment Yeah, and that will be productive. Yeah. You know, and if there was like a really high arcing shot, one of the big mistakes that people make when they when a high arcing shot comes in is they look at where it bounces, and now it's bouncing so fast up that, <laughs> that yeah. now now they're off balance. So now you've got all sorts of problems. So it's best, I think, you know, you're getting you're taking an an eye. A, a really high bouncing ball let use your peripheral vision to see the bounce of that ball because you want to keep your eyes up here where the action's going to be yeah so i don't know how many times i see a beginner go a, a beginner go like this and then it's like oh it's over my head <laughs> yeah I haven't thought of that one before but yeah yeah, so there, you know, it, it, it would be, it's going to be impossible to exhaust every single scenario that can happen. But it's a great point that you make that, that people need more tools in their toolbox. You need, you need a lot mm -hmm. of different things that you can be able to address. Um, you know, and, and the whole thing kind of plays into shot, you know, shot recognition, you know. Uh, you know, understanding what kind of ball's coming your way and then what are your options when it's coming and being able to make do that decision making. And one tool that I really love for that are blaze pods. And I'm going to put a uh, link to blaze pods in the, in the show notes here. But I've recently been using them and they're little lights that light up and if you hit them you turn them off and you can do a lot of reaction yep. time drills and decision making okay. drills with them so i've been playing around with those with my kids for a little while and i'm help them to get faster reaction times to things but now what i do is i say okay now look instead of a light going off i want you to react as quickly as you can to the ball coming out of the strings that's the new light yeah. And, and I mean, and six-year-old girls get it, and so do seven-year-old boys, right? And, <laughs> you know, and nine-year-old boys who are, you know, probably clinically insane. So um, <laughs> I don't know if you know anything about nine-year-old yeah. boys, but anyway. So I can anyway, do that another time. <laughs> yeah, we'll dig into that one a little bit later. What is clinical insanity among, among uh, pre-adolescents? So... Uh, so what's what's your biggest takeaway from having taken the quiz? The biggest takeaway um, is that we have a lot to learn as coaches to help our players keep getting better. I don't think you can get bored 
being a coach and we should really focus on the visual aspect of coaching. Wow. Because we've can... only just tapped into it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I've been yeah. learning some new stuff lately that's blowing my mind and hopefully will blow the minds of others later. Um, thank you so much. I mean, I think that wrap right there that you made, I can't really add to it. So I appreciate that a lot. And I thank you for your time. And anybody who's watching this, thank you for watching. Uh, this will be edited sometime tomorrow and end up on my YouTube. And um, it was a pleasure. Have, have a wonderful afternoon there tomorrow in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, tomorrow afternoon, New Year's it's, Day, you mean? Is it New Year's Day there? No. New, New Year's Eve now. It's so you mean we're going to have a big party, are we? Well, no, no. See, it's, yeah, you, it's tomorrow it's already afternoon. there. Yeah, see, I'm oh, still right. in today. You're in tomorrow. <laughs> right? It's that yeah, 19 you, yeah. hours ahead joke. Yeah. So, yeah, in fact, um, in fact, tomorrow I will contact you to make sure that the world survives into 2021. Because what I like to do, I like to find somebody pretty close to the international date line to make sure that everything's going to be okay in 2021 before we Sydney's get there. Sydney's pretty close. Sydney's pretty close. How far away are you from there? Oh, I think two or three hours. Okay. Four hours All right. Now. Well, I better wrap this up. But anyway, thank you for watching. And Thanks, uh, please, Thanks, everyone. please like and subscribe. And yes, Ryan, thank you. Goodbye.